Hey, how's it going? So, it's Farrah's 25th anniversary today. So, I figured we should pay our respects. He is purple after all, so he's got my respect. I never grew up with Spyro, but Carlos did. So he's gonna help me talk about Spyro. He also gifted me the Reignited Trilogy, so I just thought it made sense. So, let's meet up with the Saint of Time and discuss whether you should play the originals or the remaster and see which one is the definitive way to play. Let's go meet with him now. Sexy, sexy. Mm mm mm. Who are we looking at? Oh, hey, boss. What's up? What? What's going on? It's Spyro's anniversary. I figured we could review the Spyro games together. Yeah, boss. I would love to review Spyro. I actually grew up with this game, so I really love his games. But what about Sonic Frontiers? You know, let's not worry about that right now. All right. But you've been delaying it for like so long, man. Well, we can do it later. But the final update's about to come out, isn't it? Yeah. Dude, your time management. All right, so we're back on the PlayStation One again. After reviewing Blasto for his 25th anniversary, we realized there was another PS1 game that came out the same year on 1998. But let's go back in time to before Spyro was released. You know I can't escape the PS1, boss. Back in the PS1 days, most of the games coming out were for mature audiences. For example, there were Final Fantasy games, Silent Hill, and Metal Gear Solid. All of the games that were kid-friendly were mostly on Nintendo 64. Sony decided that they wanted some games for their console to be family-friendly. While the Nintendo 64 had family-friendly games like Super Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, and Donkey Kong 64, PlayStation had games such as Croc, Parappa the Rapper, Parappa the Rapper, Parappa the Rapper. Parappa the Rapper and most famously the Crash Bandicoot series. Spyro the Dragon came out when Crash Warped was released at the end of Crash Bandicoot's PS1 mainline games. In 1994, there was a company named Extreme Software. Long story short, before any games were released, they needed a name change. Insomniac Games was formed. Spyro was the company's second game. Their first game was one by the name of Disruptor, which was a Doom-type game. Insomniac Games signed a deal with Universal Interactive to release Disruptor, along with three new games. Released in 1996, Disruptor didn't sell so well, but Universal Interactive did not let Insomniac go. The team of six at Insomniac Games decided to develop an open-world 3D platformer in order to appeal to families. The team decided on a dragon being the main protagonist of the game. Spyro was originally supposed to be a large dragon, but the animation of such a large creature would have been very tough to do. Especially with the technology they had at the time, they decided to make the dragon much smaller, which worked out in their favor since it would appeal to kids. His original design was actually a green dragon named Pete. I wonder why that name didn't stick. Wait a minute. Yep, Disney already had a green dragon named Pete. They didn't want to cause any trouble, so two things were changed. First of all was his name. The developers wanted something along the lines of Pyro, since that means fire. The name Spyro was quickly adopted. His color of green was changed as well since the developers felt as if the green color would blend in too much with the grass. The color purple was the final decision for Spyro's character. The marketing of the game involved a sheep that was protesting against Spyro since Spyro kept burning sheep. 90s video games commercial were always super interesting, weren't they? On September 9th, 1998, Spyro the Dragon was released. While Spyro wasn't selling as well at the beginning, word of mouth in the holiday season quickly changed that. As kids got it for Christmas and they played it along with their parents, so many people were hooked by the design of the game. 1999 saw the release of Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage, and in 2000, Spyro Year of the Dragon was released. So was there ever a Spyro 4 release, dude? Spyro went through a lot after his PS1 days. His future games involved a terrible fourth installment. We don't talk about that though. After that game, Spyro had some games on the Game Boy Advance, which were actually pretty fun. He also had a much anticipated crossover with Crash Bandicoot. That was such a big deal at the time, as Naughty Dog and Insomniac Games had such a close relationship with each other, and even featured demos from each other's games, accessible via cheat codes. So what was this crossover we got? It was a minigame collection on the Game Boy Advance. It's not what anybody asked for. What? Why was that the crossover? That's if like Mario finally had a crossover with Sonic and that ended up being a minigame collection as well. Wait. Spyro had one last console game and one last handheld game before being rebooted completely into The Legend of Spyro, a Lord of the Rings type story. No, literally, Elijah Wood, the guy who plays Frodo, was the voice of Spyro in this trilogy. The nature of those games were much darker than the Spyro that came before it. I mean, it was a beat-em-up game. By the time the trilogy ended, 
Activision were the new owners of Spyro, and it was time for yet another reboot. Enter Toys for Bob, the game development company who made Crash 4 and the Spyro Reignited trilogy. Toys for Bob wanted to reboot Spyro and make it even darker than before. They were working on a game called Spyro's Kingdom, but the team felt as if it was too dark and gritty and did not feel like Spyro anymore. They wanted younger players to jump into it with ease, and they had an idea of having a toy in real life being brought into the game. Skylanders Spyro Adventure was born from this idea, and it had immense success. After releasing a few Skylanders game, the last one came out in 2016, and this one had Crash's first comeback after years of not being active or relevant. Skylanders was the last time we saw Spyro, but Crash got his original trilogy remade in 2017. After the success of the Crash Insane trilogy, many Spyro fans remain hopeful that Spyro was next in getting his remasters, as it would bring him back to his roots. And in 2018, Activision and Toys for Bob's released the Spyro Reignited trilogy, and Spyro had appeared in games such as Crash Team Racing, Crash on the Run, and Crash Team Rumble, I think. We don't know about that one yet, so we'll see. Spyro has quite a resume, but with the remaster bringing Spyro back to his roots, we can take a look at what made his original games so special for many people, and what the remaster did to rejuvenate the franchise. With that said, let's take a look at the first game, Spyro the Dragon. We'll be showing footage from both the original and the remakes, as Carlos played through the originals while I played through the remakes. As always, let's start with the story. Alright, even though Blasto's story was already short and to the point, this game's story is even shorter and simpler. In the world of dragons, a TV interview is going on. After the reporter asks about someone named Nasty North, this big blue guy takes the question and proceeds to badmouth Nasty, who just so happened to be watching the interview on his TV. The blue dragon says Nasty North is simple, no threat, and worst of all, this guy calls him ugly. That pushes Nasty North to the edge, and he gets so pissed that he freezes every dragon in the universe, except Spyro. Why was Spyro not frozen? What is this? You freeze all the dragons except the one with his name on the box? Spyro then proceeds to free all the dragons, collect some treasure, and beat Nasty Nork. That's it. That's the story. That's all, folks. That's not a joke. Spyro the Dragon has a simple story that gives us a reason to free the dragons and to stop Nasty Nork, who's an insecure little jerk, so let's go stop him. If we're gonna stop him, we should see what Spyro can do. The main objective is simple. Free the dragons, collect the treasure, and collect some eggs. Spyro's moveset is also quite simple. Obviously, he can walk around at a casual slow speed. However, Spyro has horns. If you hold down the square button, Spyro can do a charge and it increases his speed a bit, so that's a good way to get around just a bit faster. Spyro also has a flame attack, which is good for toasting enemies and breaking wooden containers that have hidden gems. Some of the containers are a bit different though. Throughout levels you have special containers. You have ones made of metal that you can only break by doing the charge, or some that require a firework or supercharge, more on that later. You have one where the gem pops up and by jumping into it you collect the gems. There are also ones that are locked and since Spyro is a respectful dude, he finds a key in the levels to open it. He could just break it, but he's respectful about it and finds the key. The final special container is the flame breath container. Running through levels you find this container that when you breathe fire on it will spin, causing gems to release when it's complete. And that's what we are looking for, but I wonder... Come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Boss, I don't, I don't get it. What? All right, so just keep flaming them and they'll break. These containers aren't the only way gems are hidden, though. The Norks you kill will drop some gems. Speaking of the enemies, they come in different forms and sizes. The majority of them are Norks, ugly green monsters. But along the way, you might see different looking enemies. Attacking them will depend on their size and or armor. For example, some of the smaller Norks are completely unprotected. They can be either charged or flamed. When the Norks start having armor, they need to be charged. Spyro will eventually encounter larger enemies, but they can be taken down with a flame. Spyro also has a dodge mechanic. This can be used to avoid certain enemy attacks, such as the dogs in Toasty or enemies with long-range weapons like these Norks with guns. 
dodging his one-way Spyro can move around during fights, but he can also glide around too. Since your main way to explore will be platforming, Spyro can glide to reach areas that a normal jump won't reach. The best glides will be reached at the top of your jump. Sometimes you'll see collectibles in the distance and gliding is the way to reach them. Also, pressing the triangle button drops you straight down. The gliding can also be a way to keep moving. It can be used as a defensive tool when enemies roll stuff at you. Not just that, there are also flying levels. While the main levels are more explorative and platform based, in each world there exists one flying level. These play more like a time trial challenge, where Spyro flies around destroying planes, boats, treasures, chests, and trains. Spyro also flies through rings just like in Superman 64. Alright, so hear me out. The Superman 64 developers couldn't get flying through rings to play well, but here in Spyro they feel great. What happened? It couldn't have been that hard to program something as simple as flying through rings, right? It ain't rocket science. The wiki here says they hired a rocket scientist to get the flight controls right. I stand corrected. Anyway, completing all of the objectives before the time limit runs out rewards you with gems. Personally, I tend to have a hard time with these levels, especially the ones where you gotta fly close to the water to destroy whatever needs to be destroyed. Whether it's in the original or in the remakes, I have trouble with both. Although, I personally think the original version handles the flight controls a little better. The original not only feels faster, but something about it just feels better than the remake's controls. Whoa, 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 what the heck was that? If that was me playing, it would've counted as a loss. Are you serious? What kind of special treatment is this game giving you? I mean, I am the leader of the saints after all. But in all seriousness, the flying levels are quite fun for me. They don't just include flying around, you have to find the items, destroy them all, or fly through the rings within a certain amount of time. That is fun since you will need to figure out what is the best route to take. To me, it's fine because it adds an extra bit of challenge to these levels. I do prefer the originals because the flying feels faster, but both versions, I think, the flying levels are fun to do, and if you don't want to, you can ignore them. One thing you can't ignore is your health. Alright, so you may have noticed the dragonfly following Spyro. His name is Sparks, and he is your health meter. If Sparks is yellow, he is at full health. When Spyro gets hit, Sparks will turn blue. If you get hit again, he will turn green. If you get hit when Sparks is green, Sparks disappears. Without Sparks, Spyro cannot get hit, otherwise he will die and you will lose a life. So how do you get health? Getting health is easy. You see these poor, useless, and innocent animals that don't attack you? Well, if you straight up murder these animals, butterflies will come out of them, and sparks will eat them and receive one health point. What do these poor animals ever do to you? I'm starting to side with the protesting sheep from the marketing commercials. As I said in our Blasto review, I do not support the abuse of animals. Well, sparks needs to eat. He needs to be healthy to keep Spiral protected, so it's all connected in the great circle of life. On a side note, the animals in the originals just walk around. But in the remake, if you stand close to some, they may try to intimidate you in some way. They can't harm you, but it's funny seeing them tease you before they get toasted. Also, if you're playing the remasters on the PlayStation, the color on the controller reflects Spark's current color on screen. To add to the protesting sheep joke, one of the bosses is actually a sheep taking revenge on Spyro, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, so... We've covered the game mechanics, let us now go over how progression works in this game. After the first cutscene, you will start in the artisan's world, and the first thing you see is a frozen dragon. Upon releasing him, he mentions freeing 10 dragons to get the balloonist to fly you to the next world. Now that we have an objective, we can explore the artisan's world and free 10 dragons. While exploring, there will be many gems and some more dragons hidden in here, but you will also find portals. If Spyro jumps into one of these portals, it will take him into a level within the world you're in, leading you to find more gems, dragons, and even eggs that are carried by these stupid thieves that you can hear from a mile away. I hate these guys. Sometimes they aren't too bad, but chasing these thieves down can take forever sometimes. The eggs don't really do anything, and they are there for progression on one of the homeworlds and for the 100% completion. Actually, all the collectibles work like that. In terms of the gameplay, they don't really do anything. They are only required in some moments to progress, but they never require a large amount. You can naturally get the amount just by playing the game. If you do get them all, it will just add to your percentage meter. In this way, Spyro the Dragon is a very simple game. It is a collectathon platformer, but while it has open world as its design, its layouts feel more reminiscent of a stage to stage design. You can go level to level and reach the end or get just the bare minimum and go to the next world to beat the game. It is a very simple design, but feels streamlined in a way that you have a beginning and an end. The game is a lot of fun, but still has the freedom for you to go your own way. 
This streamlined nature makes Spyro feel fun, but natural and fast to just go and explore. Because of the simplistic design, after a few worlds, the gameplay could potentially get stale. I personally love how simplistic this game is. It isn't very challenging. The biggest challenge actually comes from exploring within the levels. For example, in the Artisan's Land, there is a level called Town Square. By exploring the level as usual, you will find these steps that seem to lead nowhere. The player has to figure out to use these steps as a height advantage to glide to a path where you can find some more gems, an egg thief, and a dragon to free. Thank you for releasing me! The later levels get a bit tougher than that, but every level can be fully completed on the first playthrough. No backtracking needed. The backtracking Spyro the Dragon is almost non-existent since you can naturally get most of the progression items just by playing the game. If you do have to backtrack, it may not take you that long to find what you need. Finding gems is the only one that may be tricky. When you have just a couple gems to find, trying to locate the last gems you missed could take a while. It isn't too bad in the remaster since with the click of a button, sparks would lead you towards the direction of the closest gem in the area. Sometimes sparks can point to the walls though and it's your job to figure out how to find the rest of the gems but that adds to you having to explore the world. If you're playing the original version, you're out of luck because Sparks does not have this ability, so in the original, you are all on your own. All right, so once you complete at least one level in the Artisan's World, you unlock the portal to Tosi, the first boss level, and that is the game's biggest weakness, which is the boss fights. Remember that protesting sheep? As mentioned earlier, he tries getting revenge on Spyro. He dresses in a scarecrow outfit in this level, after disposing of some old bags and some aggressive dogs, you will find Toasty. Here's how it works. Flame the dogs, then flame Toasty. After flaming the boss, he will run away. Do it two more times, and the boss just dies. Spoiler alert, every boss in this game is like this. You flame them, they run away. Rinse and repeat. Even Nasty Nork is like this. I mean, in this first boss fight, the dogs, the normal enemies, are tougher than the actual boss. This is honestly the biggest weakness to Spyro the Dragon. Its boss fights are pathetic. They pretty much are just chase down the boss, light them on fire, and that's it. They are nothing special and a little too simple to the point you ask yourself, why are they here? Finding the dragons in their levels can be more challenging than actually beating the bosses. Each world has its own dedicated boss. Peacekeepers has Dr. Shemp. Beastmakers has Metalhead. Dreamweavers has Jock. Nasty's world obviously has Nasty North. And the Magic Crafters has... Uh... Anyway, we've got to talk about the Supercharge. Boss, with how much you like Sonic, this might be right up your alley. There are a few levels where Spyro has to use these ramps with arrows. If you charge down these ramps, Spyro will begin to build up speed and go faster and faster. In the Magic Crafters world, the Supercharge is just used to get past a specific enemy and to destroy a metal container. However, in the level Treetops, it gets a bit more complex. You see, that level is built around the supercharge ramps. Playing it normally can be a blast. However, there are two secret areas of this level. One of them has a hidden dragon, and the other has an egg thief. It's up to the player to figure out the exact path to take to get to those areas. And it takes a bit of thinking, exploring, and trial and error. Looking back on it, you will see the egg thief at the beginning of the level. And if you follow him, he will actually lead you through the exact path needed to get to his secret area. You will need to build up enough momentum necessary to reach the secret areas though. If you end up not having enough momentum, you can either miss the platform completely or just mess up entirely. The supercharge is pretty fun. Since it is a power up that can enhance your attack power and speed, I think it's fun. It can be annoying when it is required to find some collectibles that are kind of weird, but since they aren't required, the supercharge is fine. The Haunted Towers level is the level that has a secret area hidden behind the supercharge ability, but since it isn't required, it's not bad in this level. You need to use the supercharge to navigate through the hall and out of the room and jump to the left to take the ramp and to be able to make the jump to the secret area which contains a dragon and some more enemies and gems. Also, this is one of the levels that have fairies that kiss Spyro. When he gets kissed by the fairies, he gets the Super Flame ability temporarily. The Super Flame can be used to destroy metal crates, these metal spiders, the metal knight looking enemies, metal doors, basically anything that's metal. After using the supercharge to get to the secret area in Haunted Towers, the fairy find you actually gives you a permanent Super Flame ability until you exit the level. Dang, these fairies are pretty hot then, because they make my fire even hotter. 
Something I do want to praise the remake for is giving the dragons you free individual identities. Though they aren't very helpful when free, seeing each of them have a personality visually really gives the game a bit more quality. I mean, compared to the original. While they all looked different in the original version, there wasn't really anything to help them stand out from each other. They all just look like regular dragons. In the remake, there is so much variety to the dragons, especially depending on which world you're in. The remake does add a lot more charm and individuality to Spyro the Dragon. It really is a good way to play. The updated graphics, the overall quality of life changes, such as being able to jump from level to level, makes the remaster a great way to enjoy Spyro 1. The exploration you can do throughout the world is fun, but also having a streamlined design to where you can just go to level to level and still have a fun time playing the game feels great for the first time players. Also, with the added animations of enemies in the game, it makes the game feel alive. I mean, sometimes when you walk up to some enemies, you'll notice they're interacting with each other rather than just having static animations. It makes it seem like you're walking through a world that's alive. Once you get close to the enemies, they'll always target you and try to attack. Some of these guys can straight up run away from you and moon you when you aren't looking. Whether it's the originals or the remakes, I really like exploring the levels for collectibles. I mean, just charging around or even just walking around is something that I really enjoy doing in Spyro. And with the variety of enemies, it's always fun getting rid of them or even just seeing what the enemies do. The original Spyro was developed in a way to not have a bad draw distance. You see, back then when a game had a bad draw distance, it was often covered up with some sort of fog. Even Blasto, the last game we reviewed, covered the bad draw distance with darkness. To get around that, the Spyro developers were able to render everything that's far away with a lower polygon count, meaning that anything close to you has more detail, while everything far away from you has worse detail and gets better the closer you get to it. Not only that, but to make gem hunting easier, they added a shiny effect to the gems. If you look at the gems, they sparkle. If a gem is far away, you will still see that making it easier to tell where you are missing gems if you just look around for a bit. The game looks beautiful, so looking around isn't something I dislike. And when it comes to the remake, wow, this is straight up Pixar quality. I mean, Pixar hasn't had the best track record at all recently, but their movies still look great. While at times, it could be harder locating specific gems that are hidden within some added terrain, like grass or whatnot. Sometimes, I find myself just stopping to look around and enjoy the vibe. What adds to that vibe is the soundtrack. Stuart Copeland composed the soundtrack for the Spyro Trilogy and Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. Copeland was the co-founder and drummer for the rock band The Police. I actually really like that band. Stuart Copeland started composing for movies such as Rumblefish, Wall Street. He did Wall Street? Taking Care of Business and Good Burger. He did Good Burger? Just to name a few. He was given the task to compose for Spyro the Dragon, which made it his first video game soundtrack. Copeland's way of making music was pretty cool. Basically, he would just play a level to get a feel for it, and from there, he would compose the music. I mean, this guy was enjoying his job. They pay me for this. Stuart Copeland was able to create a soundtrack that had some rock influence to it, and despite it being composed using a keyboard, it didn't really sound like a limitation in my opinion. While the first game's soundtrack is the weakest of the three games in the original trilogy, it still has some tracks that just sound pretty great. Sadly, I cannot say the same for the Reignited Trilogy soundtrack. Something about it just sounds off. I truly think it's the instrumentation that makes it sound nowhere near as unique as the original soundtrack. What do you think, John? Meh, the soundtrack is fine. I think the songs are relatively good, but sound very generic. They didn't capture me like a soundtrack from Sonic Mario or even Final Fantasy. It wasn't memorable to me, but it wasn't bad. Most of the songs in this game sound very similar, so this soundtrack for Spyro the Dragon is fine. Stuart Copeland is still going strong to this day. This year, he released an album that has some of the police's songs played with an orchestra. He also did a tour earlier this year with the orchestra. So come on, Stuart Copeland. Let's see you play the drums with an orchestra in a Spyro the Dragon tour. Anyway, the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up the first game are the cutscenes and the voice acting. Now, as mentioned earlier, the game's story is super simplistic, so most of the dialogue is heard when you free the dragons. Carlos Alasraki is the voice of Spyro in the original game. The same voice actor that plays characters in Rocco's Modern Life, Camp Laszlo, Cat Dog, and he plays the Taco Bell Dog, and he plays this guy. Alice Rocky gave a performance of a young, eager, and somewhat cocky dragon to the character. Spyro doesn't have any interaction with Nasty Nord, but he makes it known at the beginning that he's ready to defeat him. 
Once you're on the final world, that's when Alas Rocky's voice acting really shines with cockiness and attitude. After defeating Nasty Nor, stealing Nasty's loot, and getting the 100% ending, you'll see Spyro in sunglasses, and that's when you know Spyro is a Chad. On a side note, this means the 100% ending isn't required to understand the story for the next game. That's nice. Anyway, I personally love Alas Rocky's Spyro voice. It is very unique. In Spyro 2 and 3, Alas Rocky was replaced by Tom Kenny, the voice of SpongeBob, and Tom Kenny reprises his role in the remakes, so we get to hear Tom Kenny say all of Alas Rocky's lines. Tom Kenny gave Spyro more of a cute young dragon personality, not as much attitude and not as much cockiness as Alas Rocky's Spyro voice. Personally, I think both voice actors did great. It's hard to have an opinion for the original voice actor, Carlos Alas Rocky, since he was only in Spyro 1, but Tom Kenny for the Reignited trilogy did a good job. His voice is distinct, so sometimes you can really tell it's Tom Kenny, but it does sound like he tried to match the original voice, which is respectable of him to do. Also, Spyro's voice isn't annoying, so hey, they did a good job. Not as charming as Blasto, but hey, Spyro's voice is good. With all that being said, the game turned into a smash hit, and eventually, Japan got their port of it. Look at Spyro's Japanese design. He looks cute. Now, Japan was notorious for wanting changes to better suit their audiences when it came to games being developed by American companies. We saw that happen with Blasto. They wanted so many changes that eventually led to the developers canceling the Japanese version entirely. With Crash Bandicoot, we saw the changes as well. It seems like they don't really like the aggressive characters we had, so they wanted everything to look cute. Let's see how the Japanese Spyro holds up. Yeah, Japanese players experienced 3D sickness while playing Spyro, so they zoomed out the camera and slowed his speed. And they also made it when charging, the camera doesn't move behind Spyro, so you're left having to position Spyro yourself, and most likely will fail to hit your targets. I mean, that's not too bad, but seriously, this, this is too slow. Worst part about it. So the Japanese players thought Spyro was too fast. Meanwhile, in the same year... Also, these signposts give you instruction when flame. They get in the way when you're trying to flame an enemy or a gem basket, and it gets a bit irritating. I honestly couldn't get too far in it. I had to quit right away. Alright, so the Japanese title screen makes it look like it says Ripto, and the American developers liked that name so much that they used it for the villain in the next game, Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage. Released in 1999, Ripto's Rage, also known as Gateway to Glimmer in Europe, was released with much anticipation. Alright, so the Japanese did get Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, but after that, they, they never got Spyro 3, so yeah, that was cancelled. They didn't really like it because of how slow it was. After defeating Nasty Nork, Spyro and Sparks find themselves in a rainstorm. Missing the sunlight, Spyro decides that they should both go on vacation to Dragon Shores. They race through the portal that leads them to Dragon Shores. Meanwhile, in Avalar, we are introduced to a few new characters, a cheetah named Hunter, a smart mole named the Professor, and a fawn named Alora. These characters are seen at a portal in Glimmer. The Professor is seen using a few orbs to summon a dragon to the world. Hunter doesn't seem too convinced on summoning a dragon as he says a dragon would be more dangerous than Ripto. Alora tells Hunter that being more dangerous is the point as a dragon would be able to stop Ripto. All of a sudden, a dragon is summoned from the portal. Out from the portal comes Spyro and Sparks. Wondering where the beach is, the rest of the characters just stare at him, judging his small size. You're a dragon? You got a problem with that pussycat? Then, the portal is destroyed and we are introduced to the villains of Spyro 2. Crush, Gulp, and Ripto. As soon as Ripto sees Spyro, he expresses his hatred for dragons. A fairy named Zoe goes up to Ripto and zaps him. Crush tries to hit Zoe with his club, but ends up hitting Ripto, which causes his scepter to fly in the air. Gulp eats it, and Ripto decides to run for it and deal with Spyro later. Elora and the gang tell Spyro to meet them at Summer Forest. After helping the gem cutters in Glimmer, they give him a talisman, which Elora later explains could be used to defeat Ripto if all 14 are collected. So, Spyro must go to each world and collect the talisman from the inhabitants. Elora also mentions to keep an eye out for orbs as well. Sounds easy, but there's a fat bear named Moneybags. Damn, this fucking guy who wants your gems. He charges you for everything, and he's always in the way. Anyway, in a brief flashback, Alora explains that the professor was working on a new super portal which was powered by the orbs. They just needed coordinates. Hunter decides to type in his birthday as coordinates and that ends up summoning Ripto and his gang to Avalar. 
Ripto looks around and loves the fact that there are no dragons around. Jesus, Ripto's a racist. Ripto then decides to try and rule that world as everyone's king. Alora tells Zoe and her fairy friends to take all the orbs and scatter them around Avalar to keep them safe from Ripto. Alora asks Hunter why he didn't fight Ripto, and Hunter being the coward he is, mentioned how Ripto was saying he hated dragons. That's when Alora and the professor decide to head a glimmer which has an alignment better suited to intercept a dragon, and that's how Spyro was summoned. Spyro defeats Crush in the Summer Forest Castle dungeon, and Ripto gets made fun of by Spyro. Spyro calls him Shorty. Ripto then calls Gulp to fight, but Gulp isn't able to fit under the doorway, which causes the roof to collapse. Ripto and Gulp run away, and as Spyro calls Ripto a wuss, they make it to the Autumn Plains and take over that castle. After Spyro gets the rest of the talisman from the other levels, he goes to defeat Gulp. Once Gulp is defeated, Ripto falls out of the castle window and dies. How anticlimactic. Anyway, Elora, Zoe, and her fairy friends bring Spyro a chair so he could snooze for a bit. Spoiler alert, Ripto doesn't die. He actually got money back to sell him some bombs. Jesus, money back to do anything for gems. Anyway, Ripto finds his way to the Winter Tundra and takes the power crystal that would have powered the super portal to get Spyro home. This time, Hunter actually tried to stop Ripto. Hunter, do something quick! Uh, hey, give that back! Alright, so there are no more talismans to collect, now Spyro just needs orbs. Once he gets the required amount, he faces off with Ripto, who was seen trying to kill some poor sheep. Spyro defeats Ripto once and for all, and Moneybags was pressured into returning all the gems to you. Spyro gets a kiss from Alora, and him and Sparks go to Dragon Shores to get their much needed vacation. There was definitely more story going on here than in the first game, but it really isn't complex or anything. At the end of the day, it is still a simple story. However, what I really liked about this story specifically is that Spyro has more friends now instead of just Sparks. Not only that, but his interactions with Ripto is something I would have liked to see in the first game. This was the first game where Tom Kenny voiced Spyro, and he nailed it. He gave Spyro a calmer and more mature side, while still being able to roast Ripto fearlessly. I also loved the way he interacted with Elora. By the end, you can tell that she has the hots for Spyro. Yeah, Spyro 2's story is great. It's still simple, but a little more complex than Spyro 1's. I think it works. For the second game of the franchise, they stepped it up. Not only do they introduce a new world, new characters, they introduce a new bad guy for us to stop. And he's not that insecure. I mean, he's still kind of a loser, but hey, we stopped him. I think the story is great and it works well. And the introduction of the new characters is really great, except money bags. Having said that, let's go over the gameplay mechanics. Mostly everything here is the same as in the first one with a few adjustments. Firstly, the roll ability has been removed from the original version. Luckily, the remakes kept the roll. That way you can dodge out of the way of some attacks. Other than that, Spyro has the exact same moveset with some added abilities. Spyro's glide has been improved in this game. In the first game, when the triangle button was pressed, Spyro would just drop down from where he was gliding. Spyro 2 improves that by adding a hover ability to the triangle button. So for example, when you need to make a far off glide, if you feel as if you're going to miss the platform, press the triangle button and Spyro will give himself some extra height in his glide to reach the platform with ease. I love this ability and I'm glad they replaced the drop with the hover. Adding on to this ability, Spyro can touch water now. In Spyro 1, Spyro couldn't swim. He would drown, but now he's able to keep himself afloat. And even better, Spyro has a few unlockable abilities. Spyro can swim underwater, climb ladders, and head bash. Let's go over how the progression works, and we'll be able to explain these abilities a bit later. So, right off the bat, there are no dragons to free, and there are no egg thieves to catch. The main collectibles are talismans, gems, and orbs. The talismans and orbs are used for progression while the gems are used for... Ah, uh, money bags. I hate this guy. He's straight up evil sometimes. You meet him in the first level and he charges you some gems to open a bridge for you to get to the rest of the level. What the hell, man? Freaking fat ass bear. My thoughts on money bags is this. Capitalism is king. But this motherfucker, no. This guy is the reason people hate capitalism, so he must die. Screw money bags. I wish I could. I just wish I could. I can't hurt him. This sucks. Anyway, as much as I may not like money bags, I can admit that it gives you a reason to collect the gems. Without money bags, the gems would only be there for the 100% completion. So it isn't all that bad. It's only bad in one area. And oh, we'll get to that in a bit. Let's go over the progression of the game and the levels. So, Spyro 2 works way different than Spyro 1 does. 
You'll see it as early as the first level. First of all, the inhabitants of the world can actually talk to you and give you instructions and or hints for the levels. Secondly, unlike the first game, completion of the level is pretty much required due to the talismans. However, as long as you collect the talisman, you can exit the level via the guidebook. Going through the portal isn't required. Another difference you'll notice is that killing enemies no longer gives you gems. Instead, you will see a meter grow up. Once you defeat enough enemies, you will unlock the special ability gate. For example, in Glimmer, the first level if you defeat the required amount of enemies then you fly through the pillars this specific one will give you a temporary free flight ability these ability gates are usually used for the orb challenges so to collect orbs in spyro 2 most of the time you need to play a mini game to get the characters to reward you with an orb sometimes the mini games are harmless and pretty fun for example the first level has the free flight mini game once you fly through the free flight pillars you just have to light all of the poles with your flame nice and easy mini game there is also another minigame in this level where you shoot lizards with rocks that the gem cutters provide to you. Hmm, I wonder. Dang it! He's indestructible. Another minigame example is a hockey minigame in the level Colossus. Alright boss, watch me destroy these losers at hockey. Carlos, I thought you said you grew up with this game. Shouldn't this be easy for you? Well, yeah, but I'm obviously just warming up. I mean, I don't want to destroy the game too bad. It makes it too easy. Can I try? Yeah, yeah. You know what? Whatever, man. The game's just giving you special treatment anyway, though. You good? Okay, so I'm not a huge fan of the minigames. They aren't horrible, but some of them could be pretty annoying. One of my issues with them is that Hunter over here probably has half of the game's orbs, but he doesn't just want to give the orbs to Spyro. No, he wants you to play mini games for him before he can give them to Spyro. He's probably working with Rip though, I swear. Hey Spyro, if you suck my fat nuts, I'll give you this orb I found. All jokes aside, I don't mind the minigames in this game. If anything, I would personally argue that Spyro 3 has the worst minigames than this one does, but hey, that's just me. Only 40 orbs are required to access the final boss, so I get as many as I can in the first two worlds, and by the time I get to the last world, I can fight Ripto already. I disagree. For me, when I got to the last world, I had to backtrack to other levels just to get enough orbs to beat the game. This is where I hated the backtracking because in Spyro 2, after getting the talisman, certain parts of the levels open up to be explored. This is where you can go get the orbs. You can decide to exit the levels instead to keep progressing with the game. But when you need more orbs and have to backtrack, you have to redo the entire level to essentially obtain the talisman again, just to have another chance to get the orbs. This makes getting the orbs take longer on top of the fact that some of the orb minigames can take forever like these monkeys man freaking hunter missed the stupid monkey and i had to redo that entire slow moving cheetah mission again same with the hockey minigame i didn't have to redo it but it was so long some of the orb minigames are quick or require you to explore but some of them take such a long time and the fact that the game mainly has you collect talismans if you are like me you won't have enough orbs to end the game making you backtrack to redo the levels you enter just to have another chance to get an orb. That's also excluding the unlockable power-ups. Don't even get me started on that. Along with all these issues that John mentioned, some of these orb missions are not even accessible unless you have the required power-up. The prime example is in the first level, Glimmer. You will see a ladder, and the gem cutter will tell you to come back once you've learned how to climb. Spyro doesn't learn this ability until Autumn Plains, the second world. Once you talk to Moneybags and pay him to teach you how to climb, you can backtrack to Glimmer, climb the ladder, only to find out that you need to defeat a certain number of enemies again. So back to what John was saying, it could potentially extend playtime if you didn't know how it worked previously. The worst instant of this happens in Fracture Hills. The alchemist needs to get Hunter to free him. Hunter is right next door, mind you, but this alchemist decides to go on an adventure. He decides to go on a long and dangerous journey just to get to Hunter. This mission isn't easy either, but once Hunter is freed after he gives you the orb, he tells you to come back after you've learned the head bash ability. That means when you eventually learn the head bash, come back, you have to not only play the whole level of Fracture Hill again, but you have to play the alchemist mission again just to try the new mission. That's too much, and I didn't do it. Also, the speedway levels are back, 
and they act almost the same way as they did in the first game, just with some added challenges. This is Spyro 2's biggest downside, how much backtracking can happen and how much retrying you have to do. This makes me not want to play these missions since they drag, but since the game entails exploration, this honestly feels more like an annoyance over actual bad design of the game. However, what is designed very well in Spyro 2 are the boss fights. Spyro 1's bosses set the bar pretty low, but the bosses here are actually challenging. The first boss requires you to attack him before he enters these force fields and avoid his electric attacks and fireballs. This, while not super hard, is still a step up from the previous games. Gulp is the next boss you face and he definitely steps up the challenge. Not only does he attack you with these green orbs, but when the pterodactyl sends bombs, missiles, and explosive barrels, both you and Gulp can use them. And that goes for the health as well. Gulp can steal your chickens and take your health. Try to get to the missiles before he does or he will try to shoot you. You got to run away from the missiles before it hits you. Wait, what? How did that happen? Bro, are you just like that intelligent where you can just figure this stuff out? <laughs> this guy was like... <laughs> Wait, what just happened? Okay, <laughs> Spyro go... <laughs> Alright, so the soundtrack in this game is even better than the first games. This one has a lot more variety than the first one, especially since the first one had the main melody repeated a lot within the songs. This one hits harder and is a joy to listen to. Copeland made me like bagpipes. I agree. The soundtrack here definitely stepped it up. Not only is it more diverse, but it actually stood out more than Spyro 1's. And some are intense and some are relaxing. Such an improvement. The only other thing I'd want to talk about is the presentation of both games. Spyro 2 has cutscenes at the beginning of all the levels. This really makes the worlds feel more alive. Also, going back to the character interactions within the levels, I think the original had better presentations to them. More specifically, I want to speak about the voice lines. For example, one level that always stood out to me when it came to the voice lines is Zephyr. You see, you can meet Bo Peep and Romeo and Juliet in this level. What made this level stand out to me was the fact that Bo Peep and Juliet were voiced by dudes. My name is little Bo Peep. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? That always gave the game a sense of comedy that I felt was missing in the remakes. I mean, Juliet was actually voiced by a girl. What the heck were they thinking? It isn't that big of a deal, but I did miss the bit of comedy that the originals had. Also, this character straight up sounds like Spongebob, since Spongebob came out as the same year as Spyro 2. I think there's a diode around here somewhere, but my eyesight isn't what it used to be. And this girl speaks in witty. Hello Spyro, my brother Handel and I have been sent here to blow up this castle. Hey boss, let's hit the witty. <laughs> <laughs> the presentation and the remasters are great. Not only have the graphics been updated, but the overall cutscenes are more animated, the game as a whole is presented great. Some characters even got hotter, or uglier, depending on where you stand. This game does make me wonder about Spyro though. He helps one side of a war, and then another later on. He does this because both sides have talisman for helping, which makes me a little worried. Would Spyro go and help the allies during World War II because they have a talisman? but then immediately go join the Axis just because they have a talisman? Nah, Spyro would never do that. He has a kind heart. He's saving babies now. Wait, what? Oh wait, that's right, Spyro 3, Year of the Dragon, originally released in the year 2000, which happened to be the Year of the Dragon. What a fitting game title, so what's the story for this game? In the world of dragons, Spyro, Hunter, and the other dragons are sleeping. There are many eggs scattered around. There are no females, however. How do they... did they... are they... Anyways, as the characters are asleep, a super sexy hot bunny named Bianca comes out from a few holes with a bunch of enemies called Rhinox. They quietly steal the eggs until Bianca steps on Hunter's tail. Damn, that scream would wake anybody up. Hunter tries going after her, but he trips on a rock. Classic Hunter. Bianca managed to escape along with all the other Rhinox. The eggs have been stolen. Bianca meets with the new villain of this game, the Sorceress. Lucky for us, Zoe was eavesdropping on them. She goes and tells the other characters and cheese me. It turns out that Bianca and the Sorceress are on the other side of the Dragon World. 
Spyro and Hunter were the only ones that fit down the holes, so on they go to the other side of the world. This is where my girl Bianca says that she's hidden all the dragon eggs in places we'd never find. There's one a few feet away from where she talked to Spyro. Anyway, Moneybags makes his return in this game. This is where Moneybags gets even worse. He straight up says that the sorceress is paying him to keep this kangaroo named Sheila locked up. He asks if you want to buy her as a pet or something. What a fucking asshole. Anyways, once you pay that guy his ransom, he will release Sheila and she's actually a playable character. When Sheila is freed, she does something amazing. She kicks money bags. Hell yeah. Sheila tells Spyro that dragons actually used to live in that world and that when they all left, the magic went with them, explaining why some portals don't work without collecting a certain number of dragon eggs. Bianca attacks Spyro and Hunter. Spyro makes fun of her and chases her away. Hunter then proceeds to say this. Say, is it just me or is she kind of cute when she's angry? She sure is cute, Hunter. She sure is. Anyway, back at the sorceress's evil lair, she scolds Bianca for not getting rid of Spyro. Bianca says Spyro just isn't afraid, and the sorceress bashes her. She wonders what she's been training Bianca for, and she tells her to use magic. She hands Bianca a spell book so she could whip up a monster to destroy Spyro. You can tell Bianca doesn't like the idea of killing Spyro, though. But to get the sorceress to shut up, she takes a Rhinoc and creates the first boss, Buzz. Poor Bianca. Don't worry, baby. I'll save you from the sorceress. You won't have to worry about that scary sorceress anymore, my love. Spyro, of course, defeats Buzz and makes his way to the next world. Spyro and Hunter find Bianca, and they watch her practice her magic. He isn't very good at it. Bianca creates a giant monster out of a little animal, and the monster actually eats her. Hunter wants to save her, and Spyro wasn't convinced on it since she nearly toasted Hunter. Hunter says that she was aiming at Spyro and proceeds to save Bianca. He fights the monster and Bianca gets spit out. She turns the monster back to a little animal. Bianca shyly gives her thanks, but that's cut short when Spyro starts making fun of her. Bianca says she'll deal with him later and leaves. Hunter then is sad that Spyro scared her off. In that same world, Moneybags is keeping another character locked up. Of course, he needs his ransom. Once he gets it, you free Sergeant Bird. The sergeant thanks Spyro, and Spyro notices the rocket launchers on his shoulder. Spyro asks why he didn't just use the rockets to escape, and Sergeant Bird has a perfect and valid reason for not using them to escape. He saved his ammo for this. Alright, Sergeant Bird has my respect. Sadly, Moneybag survives though. Back at the lair, the sorceress yet again yells in Bianca's face. Bianca, under her breath, says the eggs can't be worth all this trouble and the sorceress snaps. She tells Bianca that without the eggs, there can't be dragons. Without the dragons, there can't be magic. The sorceress says that without magic, she'll die, and Bianca will never be able to become a sorceress. The sorceress takes a Rhinoc and creates yet another boss for Spyro to fight. Spyro, of course, kicks his butt, but wow, I feel sorry for Bianca, and not just because I'm in love with her. All right, so in the next world, Hunter gets captured. <sighs> really? Okay, so you may have already guessed, but Moneybags has another character captured. Let's pay this guy and let the character out. This time we free Bentley, the Yeti. Bentley gives his thanks to Spyro, and Moneybags has the freaking balls to tell Bentley that he's the one who let him out. Bentley calls him out, and he beats the crap out of him. That's right. That's one of my favorite parts in the whole trilogy. Screw Moneybags. Anyway, Bianca brings some food to Hunter, and... Damn! She's even hotter without the robe. Thanks. Did you bring any chips? Hunter, seriously, just stop. Anyway, Bianca explains to Hunter that the dragons used to live in this world. In fact, this world was their original home. The sorceress was the one to banish the dragons to the other side of the world. Little did she know the dragons were the source of her magic. Hunter says that he can convince the dragons to come back if he's freed. Bianca actually considers this but decides against it and leaves. Mm -mm -mm. The sorceress says that she's gonna create a monster that'll kill every dragon, even the baby dragons. The sorceress admits that she just wanted the eggs just for the dragon wings. Bianca is not okay with that. She yells at the sorceress and then goes back to Hunter. Wait a minute, why should I trust you? This could be another trap. You're in a cage, you furry numbskull. How can I trap you by letting you out? I don't know. You sorceress types can be sneaky. <sighs> Hunter, you're an idiot. 
After defeating the boss the sorceress creates, we make it to the final world and Bianca is finally on Spyro's side. I love seeing that change in Bianca happen. Although it's not much and it isn't too complex, seeing Bianca go from being kind of mean to Spyro to having a heart of gold by the end of the game is something that I love about her. She's a sorceress in training, and you see her character change, and you can even hear it in her voice as you progress further in the game. That's why she's my girl. Anyway, there's one last character to free in the last world. Agent 9, a monkey with a gun. After Moneybags releases him, we start to see Agent 9's crazy personality, and I mean it, this guy is crazy. He also tortures Moneybags a bit, so that's awesome. Agent 9 then talks to Spyro, and... <laughs> Anyway, I heard all about how you've been fighting the sorceress and her armies and kicking all that butt, and I just wanted to say, huzzah, yippee, woohoo! Wish I could stay, but my homeworld's been overrun by Rhinox since I've been captured. If you happen to see the sorceress, tell her I'll be giving her dancing lessons real soon, know what I mean? Yeah, he's crazy, and he hates Rhinox. Time to fight the sorceress. She's no match for Spyro, obviously. She dies, but she doesn't really die because you see a quick shot of her arm. Great. Anyway, Spyro's being interviewed, just like in the first game, but it turned out to be him and Bentley, just being friends and having fun. Spyro asks Bentley if he's seen Hunter, and Bentley denies it while acting suspicious. Hmm. Anyway, by coincidence, the Professor and Elora make an appearance, and Elora asks Spyro when he's going to visit her in Avalar. Spyro says he still needs to find some more dragon eggs and Hunter, Agent 9, then comes in and says he saw Hunter sneak off with someone before he was able to finish his sentence. The professor distracts Agent 9 with a Rhinoch, which gets Agent 9 triggered. Uh, Rhinoch! Ooh, let me at him! You want a piece of me, Rhinoch boy? Eat laser punk! Come on now, no fear hiding! Where could Hunter be? The professor says he hopes Hunter is in good hands, and he gets kicked for saying that. I don't know, this is all kind of suspicious. Spyro asks Sheila the kangaroo if she's seen Hunter, and Sheila says that Hunter made her promise not to tell Spyro where they went. Hold up. They? What does she mean by that? Carlos, what's wrong? What does Hunter have that I don't? Looks like the Cheeto guys, he's probably got Cheetos. But why? <laughs> Carlos, you have a girlfriend. <laughs> anyway, Hunter steals my girl. They kiss as they're watching the fireworks that Sergeant Bird is setting off. Must be nice, Hunter. Must be nice. Motherfucker. Anyway, Spyro <laughs> Anyway, Spyro is disappointed that Hunter has fallen in love. But just as he says that, Elora shows up and asks Spyro to watch a show with her. Yeah. Those two are definitely banging. The 100% ending just shows the adult dragons playing with the baby dragons, ending the Spyro the Dragon trilogy. Once again, I love how even if you don't get the 100% ending, you aren't missing much. So whether you get 100% or not, you won't be missing out on crucial details or anything like that. Personally, I love Spyro 3's story. Not as much as Spyro 2's story though, as I would have loved to see some interaction with Spyro and the sorceress, but I think his interactions with his friends and Bianca more than make up for it. Ooh, look out, Hunter. It's the scary sorceress. Not to mention Bianca. She's the best character and I love her so much. The story for Spyro 3 is still simple, but I really like its story. It dives a little into the lore behind the world, like the dragons being the source of magic, but they were driven out. While not super in-depth, it still has little details like that. Also, Bianca going from an evil henchman following orders to a girl that doesn't want to hurt the dragons and eventually teaming up with Spyro is cool. Again, the story is simple, maybe a little too much simplicity because the main villain doesn't really interact with Spyro, like, at all. But the story works, and Bianca's story is what really caught my attention. What also caught my attention was the overall gameplay of Spyro 3. It's pretty close to Spyro 2. The gameplay sure is closer to Spyro 2 than it is to Spyro 1, but it improves on almost all the problems that Spyro 2 had. First of all, all of Spyro's unlockable abilities from Spyro 2 are all unlocked right from the start. There is no need to pay money back to relearn them. Nah, Spyro remembers how to swim, head bash, and climb. Secondly, Collectibles are streamlined now, gems and the dragon eggs, that's it. So every mission you do in this game will give you dragon eggs. It streamlines and simplifies the gameplay of Spyro 3 that way just by having the player worry about one main collectible. Also, gems come out of enemies again, no need to unlock the special ability gates, and by far my favorite change from Spyro 2, 
When a level is complete, it unlocks a shortcut to the end of the level. That way, backtracking is no longer a long process like it was in Spyro 2. No need to worry about having to replay the whole level on future visits. The quality of life improvement literally makes life easier. While backtracking could still be necessary at some points, this game nails it. Only 100 eggs are required to fight the final boss, and you're free to get those eggs whenever and however you want. The eggs play the same role as the orbs did in Spyro 2, but there's a difference. In Spyro 2, you got orbs to face the final boss, but playing the levels to the end would only get you a talisman, and you'd have to play the other minigames or explore to get the orbs. In Spyro 3, you got eggs for everything, beating the main objective, exploring the levels, or playing the minigames. This is way better than Spyro 2, since not only do you get eggs for the things you do, this makes gathering the items much more streamlined and faster than Spyro 2. New to Spyro 3 are other playable characters. Let's start with Sparks. After completing a world and going back to these specific signposts, Zoe gives Sparks a mission to collect an egg. It's basically a top-down shooter. I personally don't like these missions all too much, but they actually give rewards at the end of them, such as an extra hit point or the ability to collect gems from further away. Sparks collecting the gems from further away is amazing, and when Sparks is dead, having to physically touch the gem sucks. The first playable character is Sheila the Kangaroo. She can jump really high and she kicks enemies and even her friends. One of my biggest drawbacks though is how slow she moves. Honestly, Sheila as a character is cool, but gameplay, it's boring to me. Not only is she kinda slow, but a lot of her missions are waiting or guide based, which was annoying. I prefer her gameplay in the original. I don't mind Sheila too much, and with one of the minigames you play as Sheila in 2D, and I think that's where she shined the most. The next playable character is Sergeant Bird. This is a playstyle I'm not a big fan of to be honest. So Sergeant Bird can actually fly and he can shoot missiles, and he can also drop bigger missiles on the ground by aiming down. Sergeant Bird is slower than Sheila, and in my honest opinion he controls a bit stiff especially when trying to shoot specific targets. Also, trying to fly when you're carrying a large object can be a bit awkward. The controls aren't too bad though, so I don't mind it too much. I definitely call him my least favorite of the new characters though. Sergeant Bird is pretty alright in the remaster. Overall, moving is fine and attacking enemies is overall cool, since the way I attack is spray and pray. The only time it sucked was when you had to be precise. The next character is Bentley the Yeti. First of all, this guy is huge. The original version straight up has him in the middle of the screen, while the remakes adjusted the positioning of the camera a bit to make gameplay easier. He can smash things with his club and deflect with his club as well. Bentley here is again fine, not bad, but not terrible either. His gameplay definitely felt more situational for me. For me, the main course is Spyro, so Bentley is fine. The last character we save is Agent 9, and man oh man, this one is crazy. Agent 9's playstyle is a third person shooter. So back in the PS1 days, the dual analog shooting game playstyle was not a common thing. That really didn't come into play until the PS2 and original Xbox days. So they either had to straight up use tank controls like Blasto or try something different. The approach they took, while not horrible, was still very awkward in the original game. It made me personally not want to play as him all too much. However, in the remake they completely revamped his controls and he is such a joy to play as. I love this new control style and I love shooting the Rhinox with Agent 9. If Blasto ever has a remaster, they should use a control style similar to this. A Blasto remaster would be cool, but this Agent 9 is on crack. His gameplay is pretty cool, he has a gun. Along with the gun, he also tosses bombs everywhere. His missions are pretty fun since they are typically just blow up stuff or shoot everything. These are the new characters you get to play as, and you also get to play as Spyro riding on a skateboard. On the skateboard, you can do tricks and even race in one of the mini games. Personally, the skateboarding was cool, it reminded me of the old Tony Hawk games. It wasn't as cool or as smooth as the Tony Hawk games, but for what it is, seeing Spyro just skating, it's pretty awesome. I didn't mind the skateboard all too much until the race came along, and since I was no good at them, I just did not want to do it. Anyway, the skateboard gives the minigames a bit more variety than Spyro 2's slower paced minigames, but here, since there are 100 plus eggs, there's a lot more of the minigames. While a whole bunch of eggs can be found either hidden or laying around, the majority of them will be unlocked by completing a minigame, which can also be played with the new characters. Personally, these minigames annoyed me more than Spyro 2's, but the fact that the backtracking was basically fixed in this game relieves my issue with them. 
I personally like Spyro 3's minigames a lot more than Spyro 2's. A lot of the minigames are fun and can be completed relatively quickly. There are still minigames that take super long and if you fail you have to retry the whole thing. But now since the eggs are more plentiful than the orbs, it's a lot easier to ignore the long ones. Honestly, I hated more minigames in Spyro 2 than here, like the stupid follow the spy one. The only one I hated here was the mushroom one with Sheila. I have to mention a few minigames I hated. First of all, Ow! I went boom again. Yeah, screw this one. I skipped out on both of these eggs. It just wasn't worth it. Stupid fireflies or whatever you are. Get to your destination yourself. There is also this boxing minigame I absolutely could not stand. This one is in my favorite level, Frozen Altars, where the penguins sound like emo anime characters. It would be easy to get up to that treasure if he had something to stand on. Anyway, Bentley's little brother got his ball stolen by another Yeti, so you gotta box him to get it back. The first egg challenge wasn't too bad, but I did see some glaring issues. Some of my punches just didn't connect. Alright, whatever. The next challenge is much worse. I mean, I kept getting my butt kicked and I just couldn't do it. This definitely isn't Mortal Kombat. Sorry, little bro. You aren't getting your ball back. Ah, shut up. If you want the ball so bad, go fight him yourself, pussy. One more I had an issue with was actually exclusively in the remake. In Fireworks Factory, there's a mission where you need to destroy two flying dragons. While it did take me a bit to complete it in the original, the remake made the shooting of the fireball slower, causing this specific mission to drag on even more. And when the dragon starts regenerating health points, I tend to get a bit irritated. That was annoying seeing their health get restored, but I just fought two dragons! That's awesome! Personally, out of all three games, Spyro 3 was my favorite. I feel as if Spyro 3 got what worked from Spyro 2, but streamlined it a lot more and included exploration for eggs, just like in the first game. To me, Spyro 3 was the best one, which is awesome because for me, that means the trilogy ends on a high note. Since it has only one major collectible, you can just go through the game at your pace. The levels don't make you repeat the main objective, and backtracking, while still there, can be ignored way more than in Spyro 2. This is why for me, Spyro 3 is the best. Not just that, it also has my favorite soundtrack in the trilogy. Mr. Copeland, you should consider a music career because holy shit, I love this soundtrack. Spyro 3 definitely is a great game, but honestly, I'd rather play Spyro 2, or better yet, Spyro 1. It doesn't mean any of them are bad though, they aren't. In fact, all three games are great and I'd fully recommend the full trilogy to anybody. What really hit hard was that soundtrack. This game's soundtrack definitely had the most variety compared to the last two, and some of the tracks are just straight up relaxing. Again, Frozen Altars was my favorite track. Alright, one of the best things you can do in this game is at the end after the final boss. If you look for money bags, this guy straight up tells you that he has one more egg that he will sell for a fortune. Then the unthinkable happens. He starts to run away like a wimp and we're actually able to chase him down and flame him, and by doing that, you're rewarded with all of your gems back. This is one of the most satisfying things you can do in the whole trilogy, and I loved every second of abusing this dude. After his snarky comments, What? You don't want to pay? What are you saving your money for, another sequel? You shouldn't anger a magician, Spyro. I just might decide to turn you into a blue hedgehog or something. You grow to hate money bags, so they made money bags worse in this game, but it makes being able to kick his butt even more satisfying. After his butt whooping, he runs away into a portal and says he will retire. Good riddance. I hate animal abuse, but he's asking for it, so he's gotta die. With all that said, we have come to the end of the Spyro the Dragon trilogy. I would 100% recommend all three games to anybody, but what's the best way to play them? The originals or the reignited trilogy? Without a doubt, the definitive way to play these games are with the reignited trilogy. Not only can you play all three games in stunning HD, but it is more accessible than having the original trilogy on PS1. Also, you can select the original soundtrack in the options menu, as well as the reignited soundtrack with the option to turn on dynamic music. And one of the biggest quality of life improvement comes from the guidebook. In the Reignited Trilogy, you can just select the guidebook and select the level you want and you'll be instantly warped to that level, completely eliminating the pain of backtracking to a previous hub world to enter that specific portal you needed. 
These reasons make me think that the best way to play Spyro Trilogy is through the Reignited remakes. Not only do they give you the choice to pick the soundtrack, it has better graphics, quality of life improvements, they are also the most accessible version of these games. There is charm in playing the original, but the Reignited Trilogy is just the definitive way to play. It also has the Saint symbol everywhere, so this, this is the best way to play. After the Spyro Trilogy, Insomniac Games went on to create such beloved games such as the Ratchet and Clank series, and even games like Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2. Thank you Insomniac for giving Spyro the love he deserved, and thank you Toys for Bobs for bringing him back to his roots. I cannot wait until the new Spyro game comes out. Happy 25th birthday Spyro! I was actually able to get a cameo from Carlos Alas Rocky, the original voice actor for Spyro. Here's what he said. Well, good morning, uh, Carlos, 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 uh, as they say in Spanish, Tocayo. Um, and Jonathan, it's me, Carlos Alas Rocky, the original voice of Spyro the Dragon from the PS1 game, the OG. Um, and I'm glad that you're doing this because I'm getting a lot of love at conventions that uh, I didn't know it existed when I did this game, I think in 1995. I did Roku first, and then my second project before CatDog was this game called Spyro the Dragon uh, with Clancy Brown, who I was thrilled to be acting with because, you know, Shawshank Redemption and everything else. But, um, and now I know Clancy, a real nice guy. And so, yeah, many years ago, uh, I did this this game and... Uh, the shame of it now is that when I go to cons, the only line I ever knew was, Watch out for Nasty Nork! And so I decided to go on YouTube and I found uh, the cutscenes of all the Spyro stuff. And I did a couple of other dragons in there. One of them was, Oh, it's been peaceful here in the five worlds, or is it six for a dragon's age? We now have 12,000 treasure, uh, or is it 14,000? And another dragon, be very careful, Spyro. And what about this Ganasti Ganok character? And all these voices, I was like, yeah, I did it. So I wrote them all down. And um, yeah, the reporter. So now uh, there's a order again in the dragon kingdom? Well, mostly. I still got some treasure to pick up. So I wrote down a bunch of lines like that. Uh, um, and I, I think it's been fun to go, oh yeah, to go back over those lines again. Um, and I have a bunch of them here. So if people want to hear them, I'm gonna be doing some stuff on TikTok and Instagram. Um, like this classic line. I'd be shaking in my, in my, what is it? Uh, something boots if I were, if I were you, you gotta believe. Probably my nasty, my nasty Nork boots. Um, I, I can't even read my own writing. So, yeah, it was the original Spyro, and the directive, directive or the direction on that was, you know, tough but likable and uh, young. And so that's why that voice kind of ended up that way. A little bit in the same range as Rocco, Mad Laszlo, and um, so through the noids, you know, adenoids. Little, little attitude -y, little gravel. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be watching out for me if I were Nasty Nork. And a lot of, when I look back on it, a lot of uh, Rankin and Bass Rudolph in there, like, oh, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight this. She, she thinks I'm cute. Uh, so he had a lot of that Rudolph chip on his shoulder. Um, so um, I just wanted to like, spread the spiral love and i'm glad you're spreading it people really love that game a lot of people will say that's the first game i learned how to play on my ps1 so very proud of that um and uh yeah look for my stuff uh my handles at carlos alas rocky on twitter and tiktok all my con dates will be on instagram and you know if you guys have questions for me here or on tiktok I'll try to answer them. And let me uh, l leave you with a couple Spyro lines to go. <laughs> Let's see. I'll be done when I toast that nasty Nork. <laughs> Sounds all right to me. I'd rather flame the fools. Hold your horns, here comes Spyro. I hope that my goofy mind helps. And I'm glad that you like Spyro. And thanks for reaching out to me. And maybe you can edit this this and make it look a lot nice on your YouTube channel. It's just after school, dropping the kids off before the next thing I have to do. So I thought I'd just at least squeeze something in. And if there's any questions, um, you could do it here or on TikTok. 
or on Instagram, and I'll be happy to answer them if I can. All right, and uh, I'll say what I always say. Watch out for Nasty Nora, but he's toast. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks for the cameo. You rock. Thanks for making our childhoods great. Well, sweet. Thanks for helping me celebrate Spyro's 25th anniversary by reviewing the game. Maybe the next time we can review the Sonic Adventure titles. Yeah, I'm, I'm, honestly, I grew up with Spyro. I love his games, and I'd be so down to review Sonic Adventure with you. But what about Sonic for Tears? It doesn't ha have to be done before we collab again. I mean, I'm still waiting on the Moctezuma trial, so... Fair enough. Yeah, by the way, what were you looking at on your computer? That doesn't matter! We'll see you next time. Bye, guys.